Okay, let's get started. So good morning, everybody. My name is Kate Elkington, and I am one of your Grand, grand Rounds co-directors, along with Christine Denny, who's joining us on Zoom, and Jeff Miller as well. Um, so a few announcements before we begin. Next week, we're going to have another wonderful Grand Round session, part of our series entitled Spotlight on Innovation, Early Stage Investigators. And we're going to hear from three different investigators from diverse areas in our department. The first is going to be Dr. Milena Van Dyke, who's going to be talking about hippocampal and genetic mechanisms of intergenerational depression. Then we'll have Dr. Matthew Leibowitz, who will give a talk entitled Understanding Implications of Genetic Explanations for Addiction. And then finally, Dr. Ying Lu, who will speak about machine learning methods and precision psychiatry, case studies from RDOC and substance use disorder research. This again will be an in-person uh, round, so we hope to see everybody in the auditorium. Um, I also want to encourage everybody uh, on Zoom today to post questions at any time during, uh, during the talk in the um, Q&A function, not the chat, Q&A function, make good choices, Zoom people. Um, and then uh, if you are a trainee, please put the word trainee as we like to um, prioritize those questions. And as you will know, if you would like to ask the question yourself, uh, please put can ask the question myself and then Christine will promote you temporarily as a panelist and you can speak directly to our speaker. For those of you who are in person today in the auditorium, thank you, welcome. Um, you have the QR codes around the um, auditorium for continuing education credits. Um, we will have a lunch today um, at the end of today's rounds. It will be on the sixth floor in the multipurpose room, and the doors will not open until rounds is ended. And just a note, uh, lunch format is going to change, and next week we're going to go back to our original um, in-person lunch format just for trainees and to meet with the um, speaker. And so there will be uh, communications coming out about that for how trainees can sign up um, later this week. So keep an eye for that. Um, okay, I think those are all of our announcements. So now let me turn to our speaker for today. Um, Dr. Uh, Cheryl Corcoran um, is back to Columbia and NISPI to give rounds. Um, she has numerous academic accomplishments, but um, first of all, we wanted to say that Cheryl is a beloved colleague here to many of us in the audience in the department today. She's an outstanding scientist and a deeply caring human being who encouraged and delighted in the successes of those around her, and she's also very funny, so hopefully we'll have a, a humorous talk today. So Dr. Cheryl Corcoran is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Program Leader in Psychosis Risk at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She is a graduate um, of Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences and Harvard Medical School. She has a master's degree also in biostats, um, patient-oriented research from the Mailman School of Public Health here at Columbia. Dr. Corcoran completed her T32 fellowship in, in schizophrenia research at Columbia University and then joined its faculty. Dr. Corcoran has founded and then led two clinical research programs for individuals at clinical high risk for psychosis the first being the COPE program at Columbia and now the Q program at Mount Sinai. Dr. Corcoran has published over 150 manuscripts and her research in schizophrenia and its clinical high risk um, states has encompassed ethics, nosology, stigma, neuroimaging, sensory processing, cognition, fluid biomarkers, you get the picture, on and on and on, very diverse. Um, and so I want to, to everybody to join me in welcoming um, Cheryl today. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Thank you very much for that really nice welcome. And um, I'm really glad to be here. And now I'm looking for my presentation. Is this it? There it is. Ah, okay. Thank you. So it's really a pleasure to be back here. I was here for a long time between um, 1999 and 2017. Um, Chief seems to be getting younger as time goes on. Uh, it's great to see a lot of you, and um, I still collaborate with a number of you. Uh, so I'll be talking today about computational analysis of communication behavior in psychosis and other disorders. Primarily, I'll be talking about psycho psychosis, schizophrenia, clinical high risk. Uh, that's mostly my area of study. Uh, but this kind of analysis, I think, uh, holds a lot of promise for psychiatry more broadly. Now, if you think about other fields of medicine and what has changed in the past, say, 70 years, say, in cancer research, 
uh, oncology, revolutionized. And uh, in psychiatry, we've done wonderful work with neuroscience, but still the way that we characterize people's behavior has not advanced greatly. We still rely on clinical ratings. Clinical ratings have some utility, uh, but they um, tend not to be very reliable or sensitive enough, nuanced. They're an impression, bias can be introduced. And so I think with respect to thought and language and behavior, it makes sense for us as a field to try to move forward and to quantify these, uh, these things in a granular form. Uh, how people communicate, you look at those individuals themselves, but you also look at them in the context of a dyad and what uh, is going on during a conversation. Um, and that involves different modalities. It involves uh, spoken language, both what people say, how they say it, acoustics, also face expression. So I hope to get you excited about the idea of doing this. Um, if you are a clinician, uh, that's fine. You do clinical ratings, but I would like you to be thoughtful about some of these new technologies that we have for quantifying behavior. And for those of you who are doing such wonderful neuroscience research, uh, I urge you to think about using these approaches to quantify behavior as well. And, and, and some of you, of course, already are. Um, so uh, Steven Pinker at MIT had said langu language is a window into the mind. In neuropsychiatric disorders or disturbances in, in thought and in emotion and affect and also in communication. So how can we access what people are thinking? Our best approach is to look at their expression, mostly spoken language. And if you think about psychiatry, language is really very key. It's how we diagnose and treat mental disorders, what people tell us, what we read in the chart. And as we make a diagnosis, that's what we're writing as well, adding to an electronic health record that other people will read. It's all language. Uh, so um, there's so much data uh, for the, from say like the clinical interview um, about uh, uh, communication, behavior, a uh, sense of what people are thinking, uh, their face expression, which tells you a lot. And this data is actually now very, very easy to capture and uh, for language to transcribe. The best cameras are on smartphones. Uh, everybody has a smartphone. Um, the microphones on smartphones are also very good. So anybody who's interested in doing this kind of research, the, uh, the, the fixed costs for entry actually are very, very low. Uh, and you could do this research also in an opportunistic way. If you're already doing clinical interviews or qualitative research, you could simply record, uh, of course, with people's permission uh, while you talk to them. So I study psychosis. And psychosis is an example of language and communication disturbance. So most of the data I will show you is what we've been doing with psychosis. And then a little bit at the end, I'll tell you about uh, collaborations I have with people who study other disorders, including autism, Alzheimer's, a suicidality, uh, PTSD, uh, and also that you can use this kind of approach to look at therapeutic alliance and the effectiveness of treatment. So um, this is uh, schizophrenia, uh, just a brief review. There are positive symptoms. Those are the psychotic symptoms. What I have here in blue uh, are those things that uh, affect language. So there's delusions, hallucinations, there's disorganized thought and communication. In schizophrenia, there are also motivational deficits, but also expressive deficits. So elogia, also flat affect. These are negative symptoms. And then there are cognitive deficits, and you can uh, capture these also through language. Uh, so processing speed, verbal memory, verbal fluency, these are all very much related to language. And then finally, mood symptoms, also characteristic of schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, and also suicidal ideation. Um, and we've been looking at language correlates of suicidal ideation and behavior 
in schizophrenia, um, people at risk for schizophrenia, and extending that to other disorders as well. So I have been studying for last quarter of a century schizophrenia and its clinical high risk states. So I'm all uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the COPE program here. COPE program is still going on, doing very well uh, with, under Raggy Girgis's uh, uh, leadership. Um, so the uh, idea of, of COPE um, and also Q that I lead now at Mount Sinai. The premise is to try to find people who are at risk for schizophrenia. So we know that in schizophrenia, there is a long trajectory uh, of disturbances, sometimes very subtle, uh, but over time during development before a first episode of psychosis. Uh, these studies uh, come from large cohort studies, uh, different parts of the world, uh, typically New Zealand, also Scandinavia, UK. Uh, where individuals were followed from childhood through adulthood through the time of development of psychosis or schizophrenia. And then you could compare the developmental trajectories of people who develop schizophrenia versus a normal trajectory or trajectories to other disorders. So in comparison with the norm, individuals who will go on to develop uh, schizophrenia as toddlers, they have delays in walking and talking. They have isolated play speech problems around the ages of four to six and uh, some clumsiness, 7-Eleven. And then in the teen years, there's this uh, sort of acceleration of symptoms that becomes noticeable to individuals and to their family members and their friends. And this is the prodrome that's been characterized retrospectively, uh, very careful studies by Hafner and others in Germany uh, very detailed recounting. Uh, in these teen years, and the prodrome can last from months to a few years, there's an academic decline, there's an active social withdrawal, there's an emergence of psychotic-like symptoms, but they're subtle or attenuated in form. And so every psychotic symptom has an attenuated variant. So delusions, which is a fixed false idea that are culturally not appropriate, um, manifest earlier on as unusual thought content, where individuals are sort of grappling uh, with the experience of these beliefs that they sort of know, you know, they often don't tell people because they're afraid that people will think they're crazy, but they have these unusual ideas that are compelling, that are uh, affecting their function, but they're still grappling with it and insight remains intact. And that's what it means to be clinical high risk. And that comes from these studies of uh, the prodrome before first episode of psychosis. Uh, and then also perceptual disturbances. So rather than hearing voices telling you what to do, talking about you, the perceptual disturbances can be like colors looking different, uh, hearing your name in the wind. Um, and, and also people who are at clinical high risk for psychosis often have subtle language disturbances. And it's so subtle that often you don't realize until you're kind of halfway through the interview with the person and you realize the interview is taking a long time because uh, people will go off track and then they come back. Uh, and there's also uh, individuals can say very little. Those are actually much briefer interviews, but you get these subtle language disturbances. And on the bottom is age, but it's also specificity. So a number of us have looked at, um, well, before I get to that, um, Nancy Andreasen in the 1970s uh, was uh, studied language in um, schizophrenia, not in its clinical high risk states. And she came up with a heuristic, you know, you have these positive symptoms, which are psychosis and these negative symptoms, which are both motivational, but also affective or expressive. And she mapped being tangential, going off track, derailment as like a positive symptom. Whereas the decrease in complexity and speech poverty of content um, and, and uh, being concrete was more along the negative thought disorder. And she decided, uh, and this is something actually that we have embraced, that the best way to really uh, study communication language 
um, thought as it's re represented in language and communication is to let people speak. Uh, so she had she would invite patients to talk without interruption for 10 minutes and then she would ask them some questions, but also try to keep it uh, open ended. Uh, and so she wanted to observe speech and language without complicated experimental procedures and without any attempt to uh, characterize the underlying processes, cognitive processes. And this is the approach that we have taken as well. Uh, if if it, 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 it sometimes people will criticize this approach because they say that it's not standard, uh, which is true. Um, but if you uh, standardize and structure the approach too much, what happens is you impose structure on individual speech. And this is also a little more naturalistic to let people talk and in the context of a dyad. Um, and this um, approach, uh, let's see, oh, I have here. Does that work? Ah, it works. Uh, I can't see. <laughs> uh, uh, this approach uh, has been um, uh, taken up by Natalia Mota, who has done speech graph, graph analysis of language. And you can see here, it's very illustrative that uh, here's a healthy individual. So each of these is a word. They talk. They come back to a topic. Uh, bipolar, it's all over the place. And then schizophrenia, there's a certain sparseness in the language. Uh, and this would be illustrative of negative thought disorder. Uh, and this would be positive thought disorder. Oops. OK. Um, there have been uh, other studies of language in individuals at risk for schizophrenia. This is a paper that now that's 10 years old. This was a New York high risk project. So the data were collected here at Columbia. Uh, 264 offspring of parents with schizophrenia, affective disorder, no diagnosis. Uh, Semi-structured interviews were done at the age of around 10. So these are kids who all had a parent uh, with a psychiatric disorder um, or, or healthy for comparison. And she has a scale, the thought language communication scale, that's Andreasen scale. Uh, and so looking at negative and positive thought disorder, and the ratings were predictive of outcome uh, by early 20s in terms of diagnosis. And the accuracy for predicting, uh, oops, the accuracy for predicting psychosis, uh, schizophrenia specifically, was greater than 90%. So there's what we can get from this, although it's just a familial high risk cohort, so it may not generalize, is, and, and this actually rings true uh, clinically. Um, and also in terms of research, that there's a sort of subtle trait-like disturbance in language uh, that um, is associated with an increased risk for psychosis and schizophrenia. Often when people who are at risk for psychosis develop psychosis, they don't de develop word salad. They uh, lose their insight uh, into uh, the beliefs that they have, such that they, be they become um, delusional in nature. But the language disturbance is something that's relatively subtle over time. And then in a clinical high-risk cohort, um, this is uh, work by my colleague at UCLA, also from about a decade ago. So moving beyond clinical ratings, and so Andreasen had clinical ratings, this was intensive manual linguistic analysis of transcripts in uh, young people for clinical high risk have these attenuated psychotic symptoms. They were followed over time uh, in these cohorts, including here at Columbia and elsewhere. The transition rates to psychosis range from say like 15, 20 to 30%. Uh, so some individuals develop psychosis, some not. You know, this whole field of research, we want to see what at baseline is predictive so we can intervene early. Uh, so in her cohort of clinical high risk individuals, they did manual linguistic analysis for this paradigm, a little less open-ended, um, and it's called the story game. And what she found was uh, that, um, oh, the bottom. Oh, they can't see that. Oh, I much prefer the cursor. Thank you. Um, oh, that's great. Uh, so. Yeah, 
So logical thinking, I went to school because my name is Tom, poverty of content. You can see there's very little content there. These examples were predictive. This blue are the clinical high-risk individuals who later developed psychosis. This kind of maps onto this, uh, this positive and negative uh, thought disorder, the illogical thinking and poverty of content. So can we use computers to characterize this language disturbance that seems to be trait-like in clinical high-risk individuals and that predicts psychosis? We also had a paper, I don't know where the slide went, uh, where we used clinical ratings and found that clinical ratings of disorganization in thought and language uh, were uh, conferred a uh, doubling of odds ratios for uh, psychosis onset, whether it was measured at baseline or as a stable trajectory leading up to the time of psychosis. But so when I was here at Columbia um, and we had some qualitative research and um, just in terms of serendipity, I had a research coordinator who had said that uh, she was, uh, she understood why we asked people so many questions, but she really wanted to understand their own experience and could we do qualitative research. And she did, Shelley then David, and she did a career in that. Uh, but we had these transcripts around, and Jill Beatty, who is in substance abuse research, said, hey, I've been collaborating with these people at IBM who are using large language models to look at language. Do you have any transcripts? I said, yes. So um, uh, I've been collaborating with people at IBM to come up with uh, computational models to understand language. Uh, this was a little more obscure when we started in 2015. Now I'm sure you've all heard about large language models like ChatGPT. So ChatGPT is a large language model that's generative, meaning it will talk to you. Uh, but we used uh, earlier versions uh, in which the large language model can be used to look at patterns in language, and ChatGPT can do that as well. Uh, so we wanted to model how people went off track uh, and we wanted to also model uh, the complexity in their speech. And then we used natural language processing approaches to do that. Uh, again, it's more objective than clinical ratings. It's less time consuming than the manual linguistic analysis. Um, and so this is the most complicated math in the talk. These are vectors. Uh, so to look at coherence, uh, keep in mind that speech, uh, what speech is produced, once it's temporal, right? One sentence follows another. You can look at coherence by looking at the semantic content uh, or meaning of each sentence and seeing sentence by sentence, does somebody sort of go off track and talk about something new? And you can see here, so this is kind of the heuristic for thinking about it. Uh, these words have greater semantic s similarity. Here you have colors, size, et cetera. Where would white go? Would go with the colors. And uh, so each word can get a vector, which has a direction based on its semantic content. And then sentence vectors are the sum of the word vectors. So the vectors all sort of align. And uh, you could see here, here's one sentence, here's another sentence. And this would be an example of people going off track. So the last part of math that I'll tell you about is that you could look at the cosine of the angle between vectors to determine how similar they are or not. Uh, and um, so uh, here, these are two vectors that are quite similar, and then the, the cosine would be closer to one. If they were pointing in different directions, it would be minus one. Uh, and then uh, for complexity, you can do part of speech tagging. Uh, this is all available. Now it's much more developed, um, but free open source online, you could play. So part of speech tagging, just like every word, uh, in um, that someone says can be assigned a vector for semantics, it could also be assigned a part of speech tag. Uh, so cat is a noun, etc. And then you can figure out where sentences begin and end using this. So we had done this. So this is my colleague, Guillermo Cecchi, and this is still a number of years ago. Uh, so we had looked at a very small cohort of clinical high-risk individuals, only five developed psychosis. Uh, and we found that semantic coherence, that, that uh, the measure of the, the cosine angles between the vectors uh, when people spoke, and some measures of complexity, which included sentence length and also parts of speech called determiner pronouns like that and which, which, in, which introduced dependent clauses. So, 
for complexity sentences uh, that we found among the clinical high-risk individuals who developed psychosis were shorter and they had fewer dependent clauses. They were more sort of simple sentences. And this is a machine learning classification where it's called convex hull and all the blue dots on the inside are people who did not develop psychosis and everybody on the outside did. There's only five, it was proof of principle, 100% um, classification, which is incredibly overfitted, um, but this was a start for looking at language as a predictor of uh, psychosis in clinical high risk using natural language processing. Um, so um, now I'm going to turn to, to um, other things besides uh, spoken language. Um, and, you know, when you communicate, it's not just the content of what you say, it's how you say it, it's face expression. If you look at a dyad, you have um, time series of behavioral data from both individuals uh, that include gesture, uh, face expression, spoken language, acoustics. You could put all of that together and see how, how people are uh, communicating. And this is naturalistic. Uh, so it's, 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 and it, it's very easy to record. Um, actually, I was doing this work before the pandemic. We spent two years trying to figure out where to set up the cameras and the pandemic happened and then we, everyone was on Zoom and we just pressed record, it became very easy. Uh, but so uh, human com communication is complex, but we can look at these time series together and uh, uh, look at ways in which uh, um, communication is normative or how it deviates from the norm in different uh, uh, psychiatric conditions. Uh, if you think about it, human com communication, it's remarkable that we do it. In a conversation, you're listening, you're planning what you're going to say. There are a lot of things going on. You're, you have a lot of uh, sensory data that you filter and you have to put together. Uh, and turns are very, very important. Uh, there's really uh, a lot of rhythm to human uh, communication, dyadic communication. Uh, if a pause is too long, it, it's sort of a violation and it resets the uh, the the, the sort of the tempo uh, for the conversation. You need synchronization and speed. Um, so here are some of our uh, studies that we've done with speech acoustics. This was a medical student at Mount Sinai. Uh, and so um, she used Pratt, uh, also Open Smile. These are open source uh, programs that you can use if you want to do this. It's very easy. Uh, we, we recorded from Zoom. And amongst uh, clinical high risk individuals, we found that um, uh, abnormal pauses, pauses that were too long, uh, for example, were related to um, both negative symptom ratings and also to complexity in speech. So this probably rings true with your experience that people who um, have uh, reduced complexity in their speech, say who have schizophrenia or who are at risk for schizophrenia, also often have these long pauses. And so in terms of spoken language now, uh, the state of the field for psychosis and its risk states, there is um, an organization called Discourse that's really very active. I did not start this. This is Lena Palaniapin. They have a seminar series. They have a data bank. Um, it's, if this is something that you're interested in, they're moving beyond psychosis. Um, and you could just look up discourse and look into that. Now I'm going to make a shift to face expression. Um, so um, with respect to face expression in psychosis and in other disorders, uh, typically depression, um, there um, has been a reliance on um, what are called face action units. Uh, and uh, face action units correspond to uh, movement of muscles in the face. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. This uh, was developed by Ekman. Um, people used to be trained to do this. They would do interviews, they would record it. Uh, then electromyograms were used uh, for certain muscles in the face and you rec could record their activity. Uh, now you can do it very easily with uh, video. 
is an open so source uh, software, open face, PyFeed, which uses Python. So any sort of video, you could look at these different face action units. So in the literature for psychosis, before we could look at face action units with video, there was a lot of work done about 20 years or so ago. They were actually trying to de develop algorithms, trying to characterize the flat affect that you see in so many people with schizophrenia and also in a subgroup of individuals at, uh, who are clinical high risk for schizophrenia. And what they found was that all of the face action units sort of were reduced, but especially this action unit seven or, or lid tightener. Um, and so the lid tightener or orbicularis oculi is involved in smiling, um, but it's also involved in the expression of other emotions as well. Triumph. Uh, it, it seems to, um, people have posited that these um, muscles around the eyes, action unit seven and action unit six, are particularly important for, for um, social signaling and communication. In fact, um, you know, I've been reading a lot. You know, when you study something, you go back and read as much as you can. And I was surprised to learn that, that Darwin uh, actually had, um, and, and Henley as well, um, Darwin, in addition to uh, being in the Galapagos and looking at finches, was very, very interested in, in how uh, motion uh, was expressed in facial expressions. Uh, in humans and, um, and, and in others as well. And this actually is uh, an image of a woman who is depressed. And um, if I go back and show you, I think this is here, AU4, this brow lowerer, which is right there. Uh, Duchenne and others called this an omega sign for people, for melancholia, that when people are melancholic, they're their, their brow is uh, furrowed. Um, and he was also interested in, in smiling. So here he saw this as sort of, you know, a natural smile that involved both the eyes and also the mouth. And I'm sure you've all heard of like smizing, the Duchenne smiles, where you also smile with your eyes. And so smiles include this action unit six and seven, uh, and then also the cheek razor that makes you smile. Uh, and so here's the same individual showing a genuine smile and a, you know, um, sort of uh, more of a posed smile. So, and then also um, uh, um, Darwin was interested not only in looking at this in humans, but also in non-human primates as well. And uh, he thought this was a genuine uh, smile, uh, the, I guess he was being uh, petted. Um, so to go back to like sort of clinical ratings, what we have for clinical ratings for face expression now is, is just a value from like zero to seven or zero to five different scales. Um, and uh, it doesn't really tell you, you know, very much except one person's impression on this range, um, but you're missing all of this temporal data uh, when you have a clinical rating. You're also, so you're missing the when and the pattern over time, but you're also missing the, the sort of where. Uh, and the where matters um, also for research and thinking about what is that we may want to, if we wanted to um, try to treat these expressive deficits, what the underlying neuroanatomy is. And this is work uh, by Gothard, who's looked at the anatomy of face expression in non-human primates. And what you see here is that the, the innervation for the top part of the face, and this is where action unit six and seven really matter, is, uh, is, is different uh, for the lower parts of the face. And these are regions of the dorsal cingulate, the M3 and M4. Uh, and they have, of course, um, lots of connections uh, with the limbic, limbic system and amygdala, et cetera. But there, there is an anatomy for sort of top versus bottom. And in Parkinson's disease, where people have flat affect, it tends to be more in the bottom of the face. And in schizophrenia, it's more the top of the face. 
So what do we know in schizophrenia and clinical high risk? I mentioned these early video coding studies with EMG that at UPenn, uh, they did these small pioneering studies implicating also action unit six and seven. And as I mentioned, there is, you know, sort of, uh, there's, well, there's open source software, but there's also proprietary software like face reader, et cetera, that will give you emotions. And in schizophrenia and clinical high risk, they tend to be, tend to be decreased. So I mentioned that with the, the pandemic, um, our work in terms of looking at video became somewhat easier in that we could just record with Zoom, and this is available to all of you. Um, this is Zarina Bilgrami, who is here with me in the past and is now at Emory. Um, the methods that we've developed for recording have been adopted by a large consortium, uh, Accelerated Medicines Partnership in Schizophrenia. Um, and this is just a detail. If this is something you want to do in your research, I won't go through line by line, but just contact me and I'd be glad to send you the, the standard operating procedures and they should be available on the AMP Schizophrenia website soon. But it can be adapted certainly for other uh, disorders and diagnoses as well. And we adhere to this same open-ended interview uh, approach that sort of Andreasen had um, prioritized in the 70s, we just find that it, it, it works very well. If we uh, look at data from more standardized or constrained interviews, um, it's, it's hard to find people going off track. You really need a, enough uh, language for people to talk. And then, um, so we've been looking at face expression. This was preliminary data for an R01 that, I, that was re awarded uh, recently. Um, so we're using Zoom. We record both the uh, interviewer and the participant. Uh, it includes clinical high risk, psychosis, also healthy individuals. What And this here, PSY is psychosis. So uh, we find that um, mean action amplitude, this is all preliminary, uh, is decreased in individuals with psychosis, especially action unit seven. We didn't find group differences for clinical high risk. Clinical high risk are pretty heterogeneous, but when we look among uh, clinical high risk patients, we find that these amplitudes overall in, in action unit seven correlate with um, clinical ratings. That's important for ground truth uh, validity, um, also to some extent with, uh, with function. And uh, this is an illustration of where uh, the decreases are in schizophrenia versus healthy controls. And you can see it's a little bit around the mouth, but also around the eyes as well. Um, we've also been looking at uh, face expression over time. And I'd like to say this work is being done mostly by Stephen Heisig, who used to be at IBM, who's now at Mount Sinai, and is doing these kinds of analyses also with uh, Helen Mayberg, looking at treatment-resistant depression. And so he's looking across a number of different disorders. Uh, and so this is just a time series of all the face and action units over time. These are exemplars. Uh, this is a healthy individual. This is a schizophrenia patient. You could see that the amplitudes are tend to be smaller over time than healthy individuals. But you could also do matrix analysis to look at configurations of different face action units. Uh, um, and, and they're called subsequences and then see how often they repeat. So each one of these arcs is the uh, recurrence of a specific configuration. And so what you could see here is that there's a limited repertoire of facial expression that this individual with schizophrenia has uh, about a quarter to a third of the way through. There are no new expressions that were being made. Um, so there, the decrease in expressivity is both sort of, you know, sort of motor, um, but also this uh, uh, sort of like like action plans for behavior, there's a limited repertoire as well. And this additionally also was decreased in schizophrenia and among clinical high-risk patients was correlated with clinical ratings and also social and role function. So now what we're doing, and um, I've been collaborating with uh, Jack Grinband and uh, also Gaurav Patel, we have a grant then oh, it's on the fence, uh, but to really try to um, 
look at a time series of data in dyads. The work that I've been doing with Steve Heisig, it's been primarily on Zoom. We would like to do this um, uh, in the laboratory as well, in person between two individuals uh, where we could look at all of these different modalities. Also, of course, uh, where people are looking, where they're paying attention, eye contact, and physiological measures as well. And hopefully, uh, eventually with the recording of concurrent uh, brain activity using, uh, say, FNIRS or uh, hyperscanning EEG. Uh, for now, we're doing uh, the work in uh, over Zoom. And this is just to illustrate here are the face action units. Uh, this, these are acoustic features of the speech. This is when one person is talking, this is when the other person is talking. We can figure out when the pauses are, uh, and then we can start to put all of these together uh, in, in really nice ways, uh, looking at synchrony within individuals and between individuals, for, uh, single modalities or cross modalities. So this is an approach, I, I think it will be very profitable for uh, across disorders. The other thing that Steve has been looking at um, is mimicry and synchrony. So here on the top, this is a healthy individual, again, an exemplar, and this is a patient with schizophrenia. So there are a few things you can see. And um, this is using um, a program called Hume AI. This was in uh, Nature. Uh, this is uh, a way to sort of tag emotions. There, there are uh, issues with doing that because different cultures express emotions different ways. A specific emotion can map onto a number of different configurations. But this is a way that we can look at in a, a very easy way, sort of data reduction way of mimicry and synchrony between two individuals. So it, what you see here is that the when um, when it's a healthy individual who's being interviewed, the healthy individual has more uh, amplitude of face mus muscles than someone with schizophrenia, but then so does the interviewer. So um, if uh, you or I are speaking to someone who is normal or healthy versus someone who has a flat affect, what will happen when we talk to the person with the flat affect is we'll start to have flat affect ourselves. Uh, and this has been seen in other disorders in different modalities. So for instance, in autism spectrum, there are many uh, individuals who have, with their prosody is sort of upbeat at the end. And the people who interview them, it's almost like a little contagious, will pick up on that. If you think about the different people who you talk to, right, you, you start to align with the person that you speak with. So we could use data from both the patient and the interviewer, uh, potentially diagnostically. Uh, we, uh, there are a number of technical issues that we try to address, especially with Zoom. Um, you know, is that really, you know, people say, is that really natural? Well, it is actually increasingly ecologically valid, right? Where, you know, lots of people are listening via Zoom. Um, but there are lags, and so you try to minimize the lags. There's a question of eye contact, and there are things that you could do for that. Uh, you know, people could get fatigued. Uh, so we're, we we try to address these, and this is just an example to show. This is Steve, uh, that this is sort of himself at the same. He was both the participant and the interviewer, so he was able to look at lag. With all of these computational analyses, it's important to keep in mind ethical issues. Um, for those of you who are going to ACNP, uh, we have a work group, actually Holly Moore and me, if you remember Holly, she used to be here years ago too, on the ethical issues of using artificial intelligence uh, in psychiatry and neuroscience. Um, this could, and there'll be a lot of ethicists, so if you're there, I hope you will go. Uh, there are sources of bias, um, the issue of informed consent, people really know what's going to happen with their data. Um, you know, who owns the data? You, you hear this kind of discussion regarding genetics as well. Uh, you know, can people own their own data? This is not just at the level of the individual, but communities. And how do we protect privacy? And then there are all kinds of other sensors. And uh, I went to this conference on sensors, brain behavior initiative, and it's just remarkable what can be recorded. I mean, so you all know about 
phones and passive sensing, um, but you could put things on the skin, et cetera. It's just remarkable, uh, the amount of data. And while that's very promising, we have to think about the ethics involved as well. Uh, so some open questions regarding uh, psychosis. Um, and this also, I'm collaborating very closely with Bharat Patel, um, is, you know, so for language, is language production, which is um, impaired in schizophrenia, is it related to the perception of language? Uh, so we have data from um, Yuri Hassan's Pie Man task where a story is scrambled. And so we'll look at, we have the time series of fMRI data. We can look at the extent to which people are synchronized with one another. So is that related to production? If, if there's a decreased coherence in speaking, is that related to a decreased coherence in the time series of brain activity? Um, and we could do the same thing with face expression. So this also is with Jack Rinband and Antigna Martinez. We have these data to, to ask, is the expression, uh, is facial expression impairment related to the recognition of, of, of face emotions? Um, you know, the direction could go in either, either way, but are they even correlated? Um, and then, I'm almost done. So uh, broad issues to consider. So these kinds of studies, uh, you know, how can um, how, how can we bring them into the clinic? How we, can we add them to the research that we're doing? Uh, thinking about the circuitry that we use, and Garth, that's your image there too. Uh, and then um, uh, the dynamic temporal multimodal is very um, promising. Um, we could also think about specificity. So I mentioned the omega sign in depression, the action unit seven in Duchenne smile and in schizophrenia. We're starting to uh, look at, at other, um, other diagnoses as well, depression, autism, neurological disorders. Um, there are also challenges with acoustics uh, in terms of separating speech, which is called diarization. Which with Zoom is a little bit easier because there are separate recordings, but you still have to think about people talking over one another. And, and so how do you look at acoustics? How do you measure pauses? Um, so these are uh, some other collaborations that I have going on. We're looking at autism spectrum. I mentioned a little bit about acoustics. Um, comparing autism spectrum and schizophrenia spectrum is really interesting. Um, we found, uh, don't know how to make sense of this, don't know if it's replicated, but when we uh, interview people with schizophrenia, they're often looking around the room. And when we interview people with autism spectrum, they sink down until you can only see their eyes. So we have to keep asking them to sit up and then they sink down again. I don't know what it means, um, but you know, we, we watch these things and think about them. Suicidal ideation and behavior, we have done natural language processing studies, semantic content. So it's not going off track. It's not being uh, uh, too, you know, um, not being too concrete, but it's really content. And what we have found in a few cohorts is that individuals with suicidal ideation and behavior with and without psychotic symptoms use words in this kind of, you know, just open-ended interview with greater semantic similarity to anger. We keep finding anger. We thought it would be stress. We thought it would be loneliness, but no, it's anger. Um, so you know, if you study uh, different cohorts and you're interested in suicidal ideation, chat with them, record it, and see if you find the same, the same finding. Um, with depression, with face expression, I won't get into it here, but the, Steve Heisig with Helen Mayberg just had an article in Nature. So face expression changes predicted outcome for individuals with uh, treatment-resistant depression who have a deep brain stimulator implanted. Uh, we have data on Alzheimer's that we're looking at now. Interesting also how the structure, the coherence and complexity uh, impairments in Alzheimer's, we're seeing that in Alzheimer's like in schizophrenia. And then just finally, two, thing, two other things you could do. So if you have a clinical rating scale and it has items, you can look at the um, production of speech by someone, the content, and see how it aligns its semantic similarity with items on the scale. And we've done that with um, the experience of anomalous self-experiences 
in people with psychotic symptoms, finding that uh, young people spontaneously talk about all these unusual experiences that they're having in terms of their sense of self. And then also, uh, Bai Han Lin, who is here, who actually came to Mount Sinai um, and is a computer scientist, has been using natural language processing models, including ChatGPT, to look at therapeutic alliance. Uh, so when we use language in, in our treatment, can computers assist in determining, you know, what could we have said differently, et cetera? You know, people have feelings about that, but, um, and so I'll stop there.